Okay, we're going to look at chapter 15, which is innate immunity. And then chapter 16 is called adaptive immunity. So these two chapters are still a fairly brief introduction to the immune system and the immune response. And we're going to learn a lot of terminology and but realize that it's a very complicated system. So this is really still just an overview. And in chapter 15, we're just going to look at what's called the first and second lines of defense. And these are called innate because they're not particular to any specific kind of pathogen. So these are the things that help you help protect you from every pathogen, no matter what it is. So they're very general. And to be honest, they work really well because you get contaminated with stuff all the time. Not all of it is pathogenic, but the reason it doesn't, that pathogens don't make you sick constantly is because of, in part, this innate immunity. If something gets past your innate immunity, if something gets past the first and second lines of defense, then you still have a third line of defense, which is chapter 16, adaptive immunity. So there's many barriers to a pathogen being able to make you sick, but um, certainly sometimes a pathogen is able to get past those things. But we're going to talk about what the first and second lines of defense are. You need to be able to name the structures, cells or tissues, what their secretions are, and structures that are important to the protection of those lines of defense. All right, so here's an overview. So humans have resistance to pathogens a lot of pathogens really just aren't compatible with your cells. And so for a lot of pathogens, the reason you don't get sick is just because the pathogen cannot attach to your cells. So you remember that most pathogens like to attach. Viruses definitely want to latch on to particular cell types. And for any of those reasons, a lot of pathogens just aren't able to attach or grow in your cells. And so for that simple reason, you have a resistance to a lot of things. You can't get a disease that a plant gets because that virus or that infection doesn't, you know, doesn't grow well in the human body. Um, your growth conditions are incompatible. Maybe the pathogen is extremely um, thermophilic or hyperthermophilic or it likes to have, you know, a really um, high salt level or whatever that just isn't true in the human body. So there's a lot of um, just fundamental, simple reasons why lots of pathogens aren't able to grow in human body and they can grow in other organisms, but not, not us. And that's an innate resistance, nonspecific. Now for Pathogens that do like to grow in the human body, we have what's called a first line of defense. The first line of defense has everything to do with your portals of entry. So you probably remember your skin. If you have a cut in your skin, that can be a portal of entry. And all of your mucous membranes, the tissue surrounding the openings to your body of all types are portals of entry. So those skin and mucous membranes are portals of entry, but they have structures and secretions and things that are there to help to defend against something that is trying to get in. And so your first line of defense has everything to do with skin and mucous membranes. So your skin, just a little anatomy, has two major layers, epidermis and dermis. The epidermis is on the outer surface. It's tightly packed cells, although a lot of them are dead. They're very flat cell shapes. 
uh, squamous shell cell shapes. And um, if there's not a cut in your, in your skin, then it's going to be very hard for a pathogen to get through all of these layers. And also, in your epidermis, you have cells called dendritic cells. I'm going to circle this one which are phagocytes, cells that can engulf um, bacteria or virus or anything that's there and destroy it by phagocytosis and um, intracellular digestion. So those dendritic cells are scavenging and destroying things that are, that are in the skin. Deeper down, you have the dermis. And the dermis has collagen and hy hyaluronic acid. That word is hard to say. And those help to keep that tissue firm and together. And so those things keep your skin intact. And that, that's why if you don't have a cut, um, it's hard for anything to get past the dermis layer. This is a micrograph of the surface of human skin. These are the cells that would shed off. These are dead cells. So this is the very surface, very, very close up, scanning electron micrograph. And then of course they've colorized it. All right, so what does your skin have in terms of secretions? It has chemicals and other things. So sweat, perspiration, which has salt, so some pathogens or some organisms don't like a lot of salt, so there's some salt in there. That can be an antimicrobial. There are other peptides that act as antimicrobials, but here's one that's a big deal. I would say the salt is a big deal too, but we're going to talk about lysozyme in a couple of these different slides. This is an enzyme that your cells can make and secrete, and they particularly break down the cell wall of bacteria. So your own cells secrete an enzyme that destroys bacterial cell walls. Then other than sweat, you also have something called sebum, which is secreted by sebaceous or oil glands in your, in your skin. Mammals have these oil glands. And this is important. It helps keep your skin nice and conditioned and not not cracking. Now, if you wash your hands a lot, or if you wash anything a lot, you'll wash away the sebum and that makes your skin kind of cracked. So if you're somebody who has that problem, what you wanna do is replace the oil with some kind of um, similar oil. So a very light grapeseed oil is nice. Some people put olive oil, but a little tiny little bit of oil spread onto skin that is cracking helps to kind of replace that natural oil that you might have washed away. So, and when you're a healthcare worker, you're going to wash your hands a lot. So that's something you want to keep in mind because you don't want your skin to have cracks and tears because that becomes a portal of entry for pathogens. So the oil in the sebum is um, helpful. And it also has a lower pH, which is inhibitory to bacteria. You know, so there's there's salt, there's pH, there's lysozyme. So there's lots of things there that are are aimed at um, preventing growth of a pathogen in your skin. All right, so that's the skin. What about the mucous membranes? That's that very soft tissue that's on the lining inside of every opening that you have. So if the easiest one would be your mouth. If you put your finger in there inside your lip, you feel that soft tissue on the inside. That layer of tissue is a mucous membrane. So you have this soft, thin, uh, typically a fairly thin layer of, um, of flattened cells that are on all of your body cavities on the in, right on the inner part of that body cavity. And um, there's the epithelial layer is the layer you can touch. And these cells are very tightly packed. Like when you look at a cheek cell, when we take a little cheek cell um, 
using a little swab and you can look at it under the microscope you can see these flattened kind of round cells and um, your the outer layer of your of the inside of your cheek is loose but the, the cells underneath it are more tightly packed so the ones that you're able to, to remove are really the ones that are shedding but really, if you think about it, the shedding of all these layers of, of surface cells helps to remove microorganisms that might have been trying to attach to those cells. Now, deeper down, there's a, a layer that supports that epithelium. And the epithelium produces chemicals that defend against pathogens. So this is, for example, your respiratory system, which is completely lined with mucous membrane. So the whole inner surface of your nasal cavity, the whole inner surface of your mouth, all the way down, your trachea, all right, and so all the way down. This all lined with a mucous membrane. So the first line of defense is pretty simple. It's either skin on the outer surface or mucous membranes on some of the inner surfaces of the portals of entry. You have um, tightly packed cells. You have, um, on, on the mucous membranes, you have secretions that we call mucus. On the skin, you have secretions that are like sebum or sweat, salt. Um, you have lysozyme. Even some of the mucous membranes have lysozyme. All right. Um, and you have this constant shedding and replacement of cells. All right. So there's things, secretions on the surface of these that help with defense. And then there's the shedding of cells that helps with defense. So Everybody has these. As long as you don't have a crack or a tear or a cut, then your first line of defense should be intact. However, we know some things do get past the first line of defense, even if they are intact. Um, typically, where things are going to get past is the mucous membrane. It's hard for something to get through the skin unless there's a cut or a, a crack. But the mucous membranes, if you, if you pick up a viral particle on your finger, but then you put it in your mouth, then it's, um, it's a little more, it's, it's quite a bit easier for something to get past a mucous membrane, but um, it does have some defense strategies. What about tears? Here's lysozyme again. Your tears have an, the enzyme lysozyme and that destroys bacterial cell walls. And so, um, to be honest, if you, know, if you get a little cut, if you can like produce some tears and, and, and cry on it, it might actually help um, with those, it might have those, it does have those antimicrobial enzymes in it. All right, you also have in, all different places in your body you have microbes that are normal parts of what we call your flora or your microbiota so your flora your natural flora sometimes called and if you have a, a pathogen that is in a place that has where there are already lots of other microbes those normal microbes actually will kind of prevent the pathogen from being able to get enough access to resources like nutrients and oxygen. And that keeps the growth of that pathogen very much in check because the normal microbes are already there. They're consuming all the nutrients. Sometimes they're secreting things that are um, antimicrobial to other microbes and 
the normal microbes help to stimulate the second line of defense, which we're about to talk about. And, and then in a more general sense, the normal microbes help by providing, making vitamins that the host needs. So, so by keeping your normal microbes, you know, healthy, so to speak, you, you actually kind of make it very hard for a pathogen to be able to get an opportunity to make you sick. At least it's, it's something that helps. So that's why people take um, probiotics to kind of make sure they have enough good bacteria in their body. Um, it's not a bad idea. It's kind of like taking vitamins. It's just a general, something for your general good health. All right. It's not going to protect you against any particular infection, just infections in general. And it's not going to be 100% protection, but it helps. The better your immune system is, the better your the health of your body is, the more likely you'll be able to prevent um, a microbial infection of some kind. Okay, so there are many secretions that are important in the first line of defense. And starting in your mouth, your saliva, your saliva has lysozyme. All right. And that destroys the cell walls of bacteria. Um, your stomach acid, because it's an acid, it denatures proteins, including proteins that microorganisms have. And so it basically kills a lot of microorganisms get completely disrupted and, and destroyed in the stomach because of the stomach acid. You cannot underestimate how important this is. You have microbes in everything you eat and drink because everything's contaminated. But when things hit your stomach, your stomach protects you from a huge amount of things that might otherwise cause you trouble. So, but it's not 100%, but it does a good job. Um, what other, so saliva is something I want to talk about. Bile, bile is a pretty nasty thing. It's released by the gallbladder. It's made in the liver and then stored in the gallbladder and then released from the gallbladder. And really what it does is it breaks up fats but it is a very, it's, it's, a, it's a caustic kind of chemical that is very inhibitory for most microorganisms. Um, so meaning they can't grow if there's bile. And then uh, any other intestinal secretions, that's very general. All right. Um, and then the movement of things through the digestive system, whether it's a normal movement or in the case of vomiting something that doesn't happen very often but does happen the the digestive system is very good at getting rid of things getting things and moving them through so nothing's really allowed to stay very long and that prevents the opportunity to really set down a really strong infection so, so the movement continuous movement of things push through the digestive system and then out so defecation removes things out one end, vomiting removes it out the other end. So one way or another, if you have something nasty, you will either have some diarrhea or you will have some vomiting, but it's violent when it's happening, but it makes you feel better pretty quickly because the digestive system is pretty good at getting rid of stuff. Um, if you've ever had any like food poisoning or anything like that, I mean, while you have it, it's pretty violent, but it, it gets everything out. It's thorough. Um, interestingly, your urine has some lysozyme. And your urine is very acidic, so really nothing grows inside your urinary bladder. And you may have some microbes contaminating the entrance to the urethra. But since urine moves from the inside out, it tends to wash things away from the bladder. So, so there's a lot of 
secretions and things, and the next slide has even some more. All right, what about the reproductive system? Because these are all portals of entry. Vaginal secretions, your menstrual flow is uh, something that moves things out. Prostate secretions, so anything that moves out in a flow situation, moves things out, is good in, in kind of getting rid of things that might have accidentally been introduced. All right. Now, there is some um, protection from your circulatory system, um, especially the um, clotting. If you have an, uh, a wound, which we'll look at later, there's a whole system that will close off that, that cut to prevent any additional pathogens from getting in, although something has probably been introduced in the initial cut. But the wound doesn't stay open forever. The body closes it up. So that's something that's important for um, preventing entrance of pathogens into the body. Okay, so the second line of defense. The first line of defense is skin and mucous membranes. Let's say that a pathogen is able to penetrate past the skin or past the mucous membranes. Okay, so most things, a lot of things get stopped at the first line, but let's talk about things that are able to get past the first line of defense. Now you do have a second line of defense. Most of your second line of defense is going to have to do with things that are in your blood. That's why I put it in red here. All right, so things that are in your blood Again, this is focusing on things in your blood that are not specific to any particular pathogen, but just things that are in your blood for anything that gets past the first line of defense. So we need to define a few things. So blood is con uh, consists of what we call the formed elements, which are things that are cells or things that are pieces of cells, plus the plasma, the liquid part. The plasma, though, is made of serum and clotting factors. Clotting factors are needed to make the, the clot, the scab. So the serum, though, is, I mean, it's plasma and serum are almost the same thing. And, but so the serum is the water, which makes up a huge portion of blood. Electrolytes like sodium chloride. The gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, although a lot of oxygen will be inside the red blood cells, but carbon dioxide travels in the serum. Uh, proteins of all types. You have a lot of proteins in your blood. Albumin is the main one. It helps to regulate your blood pressure. You have antibodies that would be in proteins in your blood. Um, so various nutrients from your food that have passed into your bloodstream and are traveling to their destination, hormones that are being moved around the body through the blood, any drugs that you've taken, legal or illegal, I already mentioned antibodies and everything else. So there's a lot of things um, in the serum, but they're not inside the cells. So the formed elements are going to be the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. RBC, WBC, and platelets. Platelets are really just fragments of cells, but we include them in this group. All right, but the serum is the, the um, liquid or things that are fully dissolved in the liquid portion of the blood. All right, so a couple of names. Red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. You need to recognize either name. And their primary function is to carry oxygen, and that's inside the cell. The oxygen is actually inside the red blood cell attached to a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Platelets are also called thrombocytes. Like I said, they're involved in blood clotting, making a scab along with what proteins called clotting factors. But these are platelets are pieces of cells. And they are they break off of cells that are in the, the bone marrow. And then leukocytes, also called red or excuse me, white blood cells, that's important for um, all kinds of immune function. 
Some of the white blood cells will function in the second line of defense, and some will be involved in the third line. So there's a little bit of an overlap in what we call the second line of defense and the third line because there's interaction between the cells of the second line of defense which help to initiate the third line. The third line of defense is what we'll co um, cover in chapter 16. It's the adaptive immunity, the specific immunity against specific virus or specific bacterium. But there's a little bit of an overlap between the function of the leukocytes in the second line of defense and their function in the third line. All of the blood cells uh, come from bone stem cell, or excuse me, blood stem cells, and they live in the bone marrow. They, they, even adults have these, and then they can form different types of blood cells. They can form red blood cells, they can form white blood cells, they can form um, thrombocytes, so platelets. All right, so there's all of these cells are just differentiated from the main kind of stem cell that's a blood stem cell. But this all happens in the bone marrow and then they are moved into the blood vessels. So when we look under a microscope, if we look at a drop of blood under a microscope, mostly what we'll see are red blood cells. So these little pink dots that are around each one of these, mostly in the slide, when you look at a slide, you'll mostly see that. And then you'll see like in one whole slide, you, you'll see like one of these guys. So here they've done a close up, but you've got to recognize there won't be many of these on the slide. Most of them will be red blood cells. And this percentage is how much of the blood cells are these types of cells. How much, sorry, how much of the white blood cells are these types. So the white blood cells, which like I said, are pretty rare in the blood, but of, of the white blood cells, 60 to 70% are this kind called neutrophils. The next group, lymphocytes, make up 20 to 25 percent. So at that point, we're already at 80 to 90 percent of the white blood cells are the, one of these two types. So a very tiny amount would be one of these other types. They're called basophil, eosinophil, and then monocytes. All right. So these are the five types. Um, of leukocytes that you would see in a drop of blood, although you'd have to look through a lot of blood to see, to find even one basophil, for example, because they're really pretty rare. Um, but any case, these are, these three, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil, these are called granulocytes. Because um, when you look at them under the microscope, well, you don't have to figure this out. This is what somebody figured out, but they look grainy, they look spotty. This isn't just the way, this isn't just something that happened on this slide. They always look kind of grainy and spotty like this, the way they stain. And then the A granulocytes, when you put an A in front of it, it means not, so they don't look so grainy. But in any case, you just have to remember which ones are classified which way. So basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil are granulocytes. Lymphocytes and monocytes are called A granulocytes. It's just kind of a classification thing based on appearance under the microscope. But anyway, so these are the five types of, um, of white blood cells. All right. Now, the neutrophils and the eosinophils, all right, which are granular, they are phagocytes. So they can take in a pathogen and break it down. You remember that when a cell takes in um, something by endocytosis, there's like a food vacuole, it takes it in, and then a lysosome fuses with that food vacuole and breaks it down. So these cells will remember that, that animal cells are much bigger than bacterial cells, so it would be easy for an animal cell to phagocytose phagocytize 
uh, a bacterial cell in terms of size. And so they not only do phagocytosis, they are also capable of what we call diapodesis. And that means they can actually leave the capillaries. They squeeze out of the capillaries. The capillaries have little gaps and they squeeze out of the capillaries and go into the tissues. And they scan through all of your tissues looking for any pathogens or anything that shouldn't be there. All right, now for the agranular leukocytes, there's two types, lymphocytes. The lymphocytes, that's really where you get into adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity, which is the third line of defense. We're going to talk a lot about lymphocytes. Monocytes are agranular, but they are also phagocytic. So when they leave the blood, when they do diapodesis, they mature into a cell type called macrophage. Don't confuse macrophage, though, with phage. Phage is a virus that infects bacteria. Macrophage is a cell that is a white blood cell. So that's kind of confusing. But a macrophage is a white blood cell. A bacteriophage is a virus. So if you want to try to get some clues as to what's happening with a patient, you can do um, a blood test and they send it to the lab and they count at the lab they will count how many of each type of white blood cell you have all right so how many eosinophils how many neutrophils how many lymphocytes so they're going to count how many there are if there's more than normal then they have a, a baseline they consider normal if there's too many eosinophils that can indicate an allergic reaction or, strangely, a parasitic worm infection, either one of those. So then the doctor has to kind of look at the other symptoms and signs and decide which one might be correct. But increased number of eosinophils typically would be interpreted as either an allergy or a parasitic worm infection. A bacterial disease will show an increase overall in, red blood, in white blood cells total and specifically a, a big increase in neutrophils. So if you have a bacterial infection or disease. And then a viral infection will typically show a higher level of lymphocytes. So remember, leukocyte is just general term for all white blood cells. Lymphocyte would be a particular type of white blood cell. Those words are really similar and they both start with L. So here's a, just a review of phagocytosis. Any cell that can do phagocytosis could be called a phagocyte. Um, and so there's several of the white blood cells that are phagocytes. But let's say you have some kind of microbe here. The cell will kind of surround that microbe and bring it into what we usually call a food vacuole. The food vacuole then is fused with a lysosome, which has hydrolytic enzymes, which breaks down that microbe into pieces and destroys it. And anything that can't be digested is eliminated by exocytosis. All right, I'm going to take a break here and we'll talk about other types of killing that do not involve phagocytosis in the next lecture segment.